Hello Angels! Today we're going to be delving into the scary world of early 2010s Tumblr. And I say scary because I was between the mere ages of 12 to 16-ish around this time. And all I can say is, why am I making this video? Maybe I'm a masochist. Maybe it's Maybelline. That was a horrible joke. I do just want to give a quick content warning for discussions of fat phobia, racism, eating disorders, and a brief mention of self-harm. Before we get too into this video, I think it's important to go over certain keywords and what they mean. I feel like I should give a brief explanation of what Tumblr actually is just in case any of you don't know for some reason. Tumblr is basically everything and anything. Instead of a standard social media profile like Twitter or Instagram, Tumblr was different because your personal page was a blog and you could follow other people's blogs. You could also create or reblog, which is basically the equivalent of retweeting something. Other people's posts of anything from photos to videos to gifs to music. Photos could be of literally anything, but in 12-year-old me's experience, they were mostly just weird photos of random objects that were seen as aesthetic at the time, and black and white gifs of emo lines from shows like American Horror Story, Violet and Tate, I am looking right at you, and Pretty Little Liars. And we can't forget the very iconic black and white gifs of Miss Blair Waldorf from A Gossip Girl. You could also ask people public or anonymous questions, as well as have people ask you questions. It was basically a combination of traditional social media with a blog where you could code your own theme for your blog and design your page to look however you wanted. I think it's also important to note that at the time, the majority of the people that were on Tumblr were predominantly preteen and teenage girls. I think a really big difference between Tumblr and other social media sites was the fact that you didn't have to show your face or even give people your real name. And while I know you can do that now on essentially any social media site, it wasn't as common to do that in the early 2010s. So for this reason, I think Tumblr stood out to a lot of teenagers. Tumblr provided a way for people to express their feelings, interests, and creativity while also providing a sort of anonymity. Not to mention the fact that you can't see how many followers other people have on Tumblr, which especially in this day and age is a nice change of pace from social media influencer culture and the never ending pressure to build more followers and engagement. Of course, there were still popular people on Tumblr, like the infamous Tumblr user Pizza, who literally just had the pizza URL, like pizza.tumblr.com, and gained like a million followers, and I think at their peak were making like $10,000 a week because of it. To be fair though, Pizza was strangely super popular in the early 2010s as t-shirts and enamel pins with slogans like touch my butt and buy me pizza went insanely viral. But we'll come back to Tumblr user Pizza later. At its core, fat phobia is the fear and or hatred of fat people. I think it's really important to note that although these individual ideas are horrible, fat phobia isn't just individual thoughts and ideas and actions. It's systemic. I just want to clarify that I'm in no way trying to say that individual fat phobic thoughts and ideas and actions aren't harmful to fat people because of course they are. And I do want to acknowledge that individual fat phobic beliefs and actions can absolutely have a systemic impact. Like if you are a doctor and you decide to ignore your fat patient symptoms, like that's a individual bias that is creating a systemic problem. Does that make sense? There's fat phobia embedded in most of our social institutions, whether it's the medical field, employment, or education. Not to mention the origins of fat phobia, which are rooted in anti-blackness and racism. I've touched on this before in a previous video I've done, but I absolutely recommend Sabrina Strings' Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia if you are interested in learning more. 
As someone who was between the ages of 13 and 16 during the peak of 2011 to 2014 Tumblr, I feel like I should set the scene for people who might not completely understand what Tumblr was like back then. During this era, I absolutely tried my best to emulate the cool, effortlessly grunge, carefree girl who drinks black water and listens to the 1975 vibes. Did it work? Not really, mostly because I couldn't find any cute trendy clothes in my size since I was fat and the most popular plus size options at the time were Torrid, Lane Bryant, Forever 21, which only carried junior sizes, and Old Navy. And honestly, a lot of the time I was a 12 or 13 year old sharing clothes with my 50 something year old mother. Anyways. Back to setting the scene. In the early 2010s, some major world and pop culture events include the formation of One Direction on X Factor UK, Instagram launching in late 2010, TV shows like The Vampire Diaries, Pretty Little Liars, and Gossip Girl were basically almost every teenager's obsession. The United States was just coming out of the 2008 recession, Snuggies were super popular, Everybody was angry about Lady Gaga's meat dress, and most importantly, the final three Twilight movies were released. Beauty gurus were super popular in the early 2010s, and I should know because I loved them and I wanted to be one. Fun fact, this channel actually started as a beauty channel because 15 year old me was convinced that I knew how to do makeup and also that people would care. My personal favorite beauty gurus included Bethany Moda or Mac Barbie 07, Whaley Huang or I Like Whaley, and Ingrid Nelson. Other popular beauty gurus included Michelle Fawn, Zoella, Blair Fowler, and Andrea Brooks. Of course, there's a lot more popular YouTubers and beauty gurus from this era, but I don't want to be here all night. I think you all get the point by now, and I mean, it was only like 10-ish years ago, so I'm sure most of you remember that era. So let's get into some of the aesthetics that were popular on Tumblr at this time. Something you need to understand about early 2010s Tumblr was that thinness was everything. And I know that can be said of most eras in recent history, or even right now, but there weren't really any mainstream forms of body neutrality, body positivity, or discussions surrounding fat phobia. Of course, these discussions were somewhere on the internet and fat activists did exist at this time, but they were not popular and the education and awareness that a lot of us have about fat phobia now definitely was not as popular in the early 2010s. Tumblr was slash is the home of thinspo or thin inspiration, which basically includes people with eating disorders reposting photos of very thin people as motivation to not eat. Fat phobia and the idea that you need to have a thigh gap to be beautiful. It was definitely the 2.0 digital version of the 90s heroin chic trend. I personally wasn't into this style, but the twee aesthetic was extremely popular on Tumblr in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Since I'm not the most knowledgeable about this aesthetic because it wasn't my personal cup of tea, I'm going to quote Natalie Mitchie from their article in Fashion Magazine. The hipster aesthetic was popularized on Tumblr during the late 2000s and early 2010s and could be described as cutesy, quaint, or vintage core. The British term twee actually dates back to the early 1900s where it was derived from a baby talk mispronunciation of the word sweet. Staples of this style include colorful tights, oversized collars, bows, cardigans, blouses, and hairstyles with bangs. Certain objects also became synonymous with the aesthetic, like ukuleles, teacups, and typewriters. Drawing inspiration from mod styles of the 1960s and 70s, Twee also relies on accessories like belts, hair bows, or berets, and satchel bags. Actor Zoe De Chanel is associated with the era, embodying twee style on the sitcom New Girl, which premiered in 2011. 
Director Wes Anderson also became known for capturing Twee in his whimsical films, using a distinctly colorful vintage aesthetic in his cinematography. With some of the most popular connoisseurs of Twee being celebrities like Alexa Chung, Taylor Swift, and Zoe De Chanel, I wonder what they all have in common. Oh yeah, they're all thin. And while Alexa Chung is half Chinese, a lot of the most popular sources of inspiration for these Tumblr aesthetics were also white. Mandy Lee, or TikTok user Old Loser in Brooklyn, has some great videos about the Twee aesthetic and the toxic beauty standards that existed within it if you would like to learn more about it. Ah, uh, the grunge aesthetic. 13 year old me literally wanted nothing more than to be an edgy little grunge bitch with my striped t-shirt, denim jacket, black skater skirt, and creepers. But alas, internalized fat phobia and also just fat phobia in general made it very clear that these styles were not meant to be worn by someone like me. The trendiest clothes you could wear in the early 2010s to achieve the 2014 Tumblr grunge aesthetic were American Apparel skater skirts, fishnets, Doc Martens, creepers, thigh-high socks, baggy denim jackets, striped tops, flannel shirts, ripped jeans, and basically anything that screams. My favorite bands are the 1975 Arctic Monkeys and The Neighborhood. The main sources of inspiration for this aesthetic were Effie Stoneham from Skins, Aria Montgomery from Pretty Little Liars, and Sky Ferreira. Which again, the common denominator between all of these people and also the people who went viral on Tumblr for this grunge aesthetic was that they were basically all thin and white or light-skinned. <laughs> While there are endless amounts of aesthetics that were popular on Tumblr in the early 2010s, I feel the sick and twisted urge to mention Brandy Melville. Now, when I tell you I am completely biased against this store, I mean it. For those of you who don't know what Brandy Melville is, first of all, you are so lucky. But second of all, it's a clothing store aimed at teenage girls that gained a lot of popularity in the early 2010s, and it's famous for only offering a one-size-fits-most selection, which is basically the equivalent to a size double zero to four. This obviously created a lot of exclusivity around the brand, as you could basically only fit into their clothes if you were a size extra extra small to a medium. Beyond exclusivity, this brand also helped create and encourage a lot of young girls' eating disorders, especially if they couldn't already fit into the clothes. I don't want to delve too deep into this store because this company just genuinely pisses me off, but they've been allegedly accused of being a very racist and fat phobic company. For instance, the former senior vice president said that he was instructed by the CEO of Brandy Melville to only hire girls who fit a quote, specific criteria. He went on to say, quote, if she was black, if she was fat, he didn't want them in the store. This racism and fat phobia is very obvious, not only by their size selection, but also their Instagram page. If you scroll through their posts on Instagram, most of the photos will be of thin white women. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm pretty sure they got called out for their racism and fat phobia a year or two ago, and instead of actually addressing it or making any meaningful change, they just turned off their Instagram comments. Allegedly, let's move on from this store because I genuinely have such disdain for it. Although racism and fat phobia, of course, still exist, 2010's Tumblr was very regressive. At the core of these aesthetics weren't the clothes themselves, but rather the people slash bodies that were wearing them. Which honestly sounds very familiar because we still see that today and I'm just gonna plug my own video real quick because I made a whole video about Y2K fashion and our obsession with thinness. 
during this era, it didn't matter as much whether you looked good or cool in your grungy or twee outfit. It mattered whether or not you were wearing these styles and you had a thigh gap. The celebrities and characters I mentioned before weren't just used as style inspiration, but as thin inspiration as well. Like, there were no popularized forms of body positivity, body neutrality, or any sort of fat acceptance. Influencers as we know it today did not exist in the early 2010s, and in fact, there was just a very small community of popular plus-size bloggers that included people like Gabby Fresh, Nicolette Mason, Callie Thorpe, Kelly Brown, and Nadia Albuhassan. ED culture on Tumblr was worsened by the popularity of the sad girl, which was basically the idea that being depressed was cool and thus had certain aesthetics associated with it, like smoking cigarettes, self-harming, and being thin. Celebrities and characters like Lana Del Rey, Effie Stoneham, and Marina and the Diamonds were super popular on Tumblr during this time and truly embodied the sad girl aesthetic that so many teenage girls both envied and loved. I don't wanna to go too into the whole Tumblr sad girl persona, but Mina has a great video about this that I absolutely recommend watching. I mentioned Tumblr user Pizza earlier, and while I completely understand that she was basically a child during her peak on the website, while I was doing research, I found that she made a majority of her money through her blog by selling diet pills. According to an article by Melissa Fife, Two men approached Pizza with the idea to use their social media skills to create diet pill ads that masqueraded as Tumblr posts, essentially fake testimonials from women talking about their weight loss journey. Miller, aka Pizza, would reblog these posts and get a small payment if the user clicked on the link, which is basically an affiliate link. According to Miss Pizza herself, she basically said that she should have at least looked into the pills before posting about them, although she wasn't against diet pills. She said, quote, I was tempted to try them myself. If there is a super easy way to lose weight and get a flat tummy, you might as well try it unless it was super harmful. Now, this video isn't to call out any one specific person, especially not someone who was a teenager during the peak of their fame. But I do think it's interesting that one of the most famous people on Tumblr at the time made a majority of their money from selling diet pills to their followers who were basically also mostly children. After all, this was the era of Thinspo and the infamous Kate Moss quote, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. I know I've basically been talking about eating disorders this entire video, but if you find the topic of eating disorders particularly triggering, then I highly recommend skipping to this timestamp on the screen as I'm going to be delving a little further into eating disorder culture on Tumblr. Something that was very popular on Tumblr at this time and honestly continues to be popular is content that has to do with starvation and the pro-Anna movement. I do just want to mention very quickly that I am not going to add any thinspo photos to this video because honestly, I find them extremely triggering. I know other people find them extremely triggering and I just highly discourage anyone who watches this video to go look up those photos because honestly, they're just very disturbing um, and triggering. I have actually debated a lot whether or not I even want to include this next segment because one, I'm worried that people might find it very disturbing, and two, for like lack of a better phrase, I'm scared I might give people ideas, which clearly I don't want to do, but at the same time, um, this kind of content has affected so many people not just my age but younger and older so i feel like it's important to openly discuss how harmful it is so i do just want to put that out there before i go into this quote that i'm about to read as written by olivia smith pro anna is short for pro anorexia and refers to content that promotes extreme food restrictions or anorexic behavior it's accompanied by promia, which is content that promotes bulimia and bulimic behavior in the same way. Pro-ana or promia content can consist of anything from 
thinspo pictures to tips and tricks that will help with restricting calorie intake or disordered eating. Content also often includes little tips and tricks to avoid getting caught by either parents or doctors. It's important to note that this kind of content is very different from people sharing their journeys with eating disorder recovery. Those kinds of posts, when done right, can be therapeutic and inspiring, both for the content creators and the communities that follow them. As someone who has struggled a lot and continues to struggle with disordered eating, this content is obviously harmful and the consequences of consuming this content is something that will last for a while. Purposely seeking out and actively looking at content that encourages you not to eat can destroy any semblance of a healthy body image, actively create and worsen eating disorders, and can lead to other mental health and physical health consequences such as depression and malnutrition. There have been lots of discussions surrounding the 2014 Tumblr Girl comeback on TikTok as either Gen Zers who might not have been around for it the first time or people who were around for it the first time but have just started feeling nostalgic and have decided to bring some of these trends back. So naturally, for people who were around for early 2010s Tumblr the first time, the idea of it coming back is absolutely horrifying. However, the difference between the content on early 2010s Tumblr versus 2020s TikTok is that the content on TikTok can be a lot less obvious and blatant than Tumblr. From the promotion of under eating through what I eat in a day videos to unlicensed people acting as dietitians, to the idea that if you just work out and eat healthy enough, you can also be a size two. TikTok is also chock full of fat phobia and pro Anna content. Also, just as a quick disclaimer, like I am obviously not saying that every single person who makes a what I eat in a day video is promoting under eating, but there are a lot of videos that do, especially by popular like health and fitness accounts on TikTok that often encourage a major calorie deficit either blatantly or just through like showing the amount of food they eat and it obviously not being enough to provide them the full nutrition that they need. And like this isn't anything new because I haven't even mentioned the overt fat phobic trends that have already existed on TikTok that take the form of blatant body checking, audios that actively body shame fat people, and weaponizing fat phobia with the idea that skinny shaming and fat shaming are the same thing, like TikTok has already had a problem with fat phobia. And this doesn't even cover the immense banning and censorship of fat creators, black creators, disabled creators, and all of these intersections. While there's nothing inherently wrong with participating in fashion trends from 2014 Tumblr, there is a problem with all of the fat phobia and racism that came with those trends. And fortunately, I have seen a lot of people talk about the fat phobia that came with trends like Twee and other Tumblr aesthetics, and I've seen a lot of fat people on TikTok decide that this time around they are reclaiming these trends and they're not just going to allow the fat phobia that came with them the first time around to come back with the 2014 Tumblr resurgence. And while TikTok has already had an abundance of fat phobia and racism, I really hope we've learned our lesson when it comes to the resurgence of these trends. Oy vey, this video was very depressing and taxing, so I am personally going to go get myself a peach banana smoothie with mango jelly because I really want one, and I highly encourage all of you to go get yourselves a snack or a treat or just something tasty as well because I think we could all use it. I don't know if I will personally be participating in any early 2010s fashion trends, mostly because it still feels too fresh and raw, at least to me. And I know there's a lot of people who have started great conversations and made amazing videos surrounding the accelerating trend cycle with the creation of fast fashion. Um, yeah, I'm sorry guys, I was like, 13 to 16 during like peak Tumblr. So 
I'm 23 now. I just feel like it's way too soon. And while I appreciate some of the nostalgia as someone that grew up fat and wasn't able to participate in these trends like I would have wanted to back then, like, I don't know, it's kind of a sore spot for me. And even though I could participate in some of these trends now to kind of try to reclaim it, um, the styles just aren't personally my cup of tea that much. But with that being said, if you guys have been thinking about trying out early 2010s Tumblr trends, I definitely say go for it as long as it's the fashion and not the racism and fat phobia. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and please let me know what other topics you'd like me to make a video on. But yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Don't forget to get yourself something tasty and I will see you in my next video. Bye.